Today is the second of two lectures by Jeff Weber. Um, the first one was yesterday. For those of you who didn't attend, uh, it was entitled The Rise and Decline of the Latin American Left, Latin America's Pink Tide. Um, both of these talks, as well as a seminar tomorrow afternoon, are under the overarching title of The Political Economy of Liberation Struggles. And Jeff, um, if I can call him Jeff for the formal introduction, uh, is senior lecturer in the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. He also sits on the editorial board of Historical Materialism, and he's the author of a bunch of books, um, the latest of which is The Last Day of Oppression and the First Day of the Same, The Politics and Economics of the New Latin American Left. But previously he wrote Blood of Extraction, Canadian Imperialism in Latin America with Todd Gordon. Red October, Left Indigenous Struggles in Modern Bolivia, and From Rebellion to Reform in Bolivia, Class Struggle, Indigenous Liberation, and the Politics of Evo Morales. And he's also involved right now in writing two other books. And that's not even the extent of it. I mean, he's very prolific. And it was, I, I thought it was particularly striking yesterday during the Q&A when he got a whole series of very different questions and provided both very deep but also very sophisticated responses, demonstrating a breadth and depth of knowledge that's pretty remarkable. So, um, I mean, he's really a very prolific and productive author and knows a tremendous amount about every, seemingly every country of Latin America. Um, so, I want to welcome you today to hear Class Struggle and Social Movement, Totality, Production, and Social Reproduction. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much for that uh, introduction. Um, and it's great to be here for the second day. Um, this talk, entitled Marxism, Class Struggle, and Social Movement, is going to be quite different than yesterday. Latin America really doesn't appear in it. Um, I thought it might be slightly boring to continue yesterday's topic in different ways. Um, so this is more of a theoretical piece, but it also touches on some uh, characteristic social movements and forms of class struggle of the contemporary period um, as well. So there are two protocols for a Marxist reflection on Marxism, uh, Perry Anderson suggested in 1983. The first protocol is that it is always necessary to situate the course of historical materialism in a specific period, to quote, Mark, uh, to quote Anderson, within the intricate web of national and international class struggles which characterize it and whose course its own instruments of thought are designed to capture. The second protocol has to do with a ruthless accounting of, quote, the internal obstacles, aporias, blockages of the theory in its own attempt to approximate a general truth of the time. An internal history of cognitive blindnesses and impediments, as well as advances or insights, is essential to a real scrutiny of the fortunes of Marxism in these past years as of other ones. Marxist theory for Anderson acquires its proper contours only in direct relation to a mass revolutionary movement. When the latter is effectively absent or defeated, the former is inevitably deformed or eclipsed. The premise of this pervasive theme is, of course, the tenet of the unity of theory and practice, traditionally deemed to be, uh, to define Marxist epistemology as such. So my talk today offers such a two-pronged reflection on Marxist theory, but only in the narrow domain of social movements and social movement studies. I want to begin with a cursory panorama of international class struggles over the last few decades, and then move through a series of conceptual issues. Capitalism and capitalist totality, processual and historical understandings of class struggle, the collective action repertoires of strike and riot, and their relationship to different periods of capitalism, and finally, how, how class struggle necessarily spans the spheres of production, reproduction, and social reproduction. So because I only have 47 minutes left, I'm obviously going to touch only in a cursory, cursory way 
on all of these different themes, but we can explore them more in the conversation that follows. To start with the international conjuncture, the course of the 1980s and 1990s ushered in a much worse international terrain for historical materialism than Anderson expected when he was writing in 1983, as neoliberal counter-reformation spread its tentacles unrelentingly, albeit unevenly, across the globe. The forward march of neoliberal economics was accompanied by the backwards diminution of Marx's theory. Writing in the mid-1990s, in that early post-Cold War ambiance, Ellen Mexon's Wood lamented, quote, critique of capitalism is out of fashion. Capitalist triumphalism on the right is mirrored on the left by a sharp contraction of socialist aspirations. As the right seized initiative in much of the world, to quote Wood again, left intellectuals, if not embracing capitalism as the best of all possible worlds, hope for little more than a space in its, in its interstices and look forward to only the most local and particular resistances. At precisely the moment then when a systemic analysis and critique of capitalism was most required, capitalist totality nearly disappeared as a subject of inquiry. The late 1990s and the early 2000s saw a brief revival from Seattle to Genoa to Chiapas of new forms of anti-neoliberal and sometimes anti-capitalist struggle in North America and Western Europe with a wider international inflection in the annual World Social Forums, known commonly together as the anti-globalization or alter globalization movement. This faded quickly, however, after the September 11, 2001 attacks in the United States and the long shadow cast by the subsequent war on terror. Still elsewhere in the world, and particularly in China, incipient insurgencies of labor were taking shape in the new manufacturing centers of Global, of the global capitalist market. Meanwhile, as I discussed in yesterday's lecture, in South America, a novel recomposition of the social and political left emerged out of a steep regional economic crisis of neoliberalism at the turn of the century in Latin America. When the commodity boom turned to bust, beginning in 2011-2012, with the slowdown of China, Latin American left governments faltered and new rec new configurations of the social and political right recovered lost ground. A new cycle of conflict was on the horizon elsewhere in the world, however. Capitalism re-entered colloquial vocabularies around the world in 2008 with the onset of the worst crisis of the system since the Great Depression. And with a three-year time lag, a new season of revolt coming out of the 2008 crisis emerges on the scene in 2011. The blood of social protest flowed through the capillaries of the Arab world's revolutions for bread, freedom, and social justice in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Libya, Bahrain, Yemen, and so on. Southern Europe's anti-austerity movements of the squares in Greece, Spain, Portugal. The student movements that year in Chile and Quebec, which were much more than just student movements. Rebellions in the new authoritarian enclaves of the semi-periphery on the streets of Brazil's major cities beginning in June 2013 and Turkey's Gezi Park in 2013 and the recovery of struggle in the United States with the Occupy movement in 2011, the Wisconsin protests, and a few, few years later, immigrant rights movements, the Black Lives Matter, and the, the new politicizing layers around the Bernie Sanders campaign not the campaign itself so much, but the politicizing layers around it, and the explosive associated growth of the Democratic Socialists of America, or the DSA. So this real-world coupling of system crisis, beginning in 2008, and explosive, if delayed, growth in protest, has meant that after an extended hiatus, attention to the dynamics of capitalism has begun, albeit haltingly, to return to mainstream social movement studies. The most comprehensive early analysis of the macro characteristics of at least the very beginning of the latest protest cycle, drawing on media survey data from 1991 to 2011, reaches two principal conclusions. And this is a study coming out of the Origi Center at Johns Hopkins University. The first conclusion is that workers, 
in defensive and offensive capacities, played a bigger part in the latest wave of revolt than is generally recognized in the burgeoning scholarship. Defensively, in areas of declining production, workers struggled against being unmade. Offensively, in areas of rising manufacturing investment, emergent working classes struck at the point of production as their bargaining power increased. And variegated mixes of, of these types of offensive and defensive working class struggle developed in different social formations across the world economy. But the important point here is that workers and workers' struggles played a bigger role than is often assumed in the 1991 to 2011 period uh, covered in this study. The second conclusion that is drawn, however, towards the end of this cycle in 2011 is an expression of the secular tendency for capitalism, or is associated with the expression of the secular tendency for capitalism to destroy, to destroy more livelihoods than it creates over time such that the 2011 events in particular were marked by a form of class-based protest against chronic unemployment, a key issue, for example, in the Arab revolts, by a growing relative surplus population relatively excluded from capitalist exploitation. So we arrive then at the problem of capitalism. How has social movement theory weathered these recent developments in protest arising out of the latest world crisis of capitalism. It is only a slight exaggeration to say that the central fault lines in social movement studies today continue to be traceable to the post-Marxist moment of the early 1980s. Writing in the middle of that decade, Gene Cohen characterized the major divide in this literature as running through a European identity-oriented approach on the one hand and an American resource mobilization or strategy framework on the other. The new social movement theorists of the identity camp were responding to the emergence of heterogeneous movements in Europe in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The ecology movement, peace, gender, ethnicity, age, neighborhood, environment, sexual diversity, and so on, which they believed could not be explained or understood using the categories of Marxian analysis. In ostensibly post-industrial European societies, the new social movement theories argued that these new movements could not be captured by a focus on the economy or by a focus on the state. Their domain of contention was rather civil society. And what is more, Marxism couldn't just not explain these new movements, but Marxist theory from their perspective had always been reductionist in at least two senses and therefore should be discarded as such. The first reductionism that they said Marxism was guilty of was an economic reductionism because an economic logic determines social formations and political and ideological processes such that politics and ideology are epiphenomena of the economic realm. And the second reduction of Marxism, according to new social movement critics, was in terms of class. Given that, in their ostensibly mechanical understanding of capitalism, Marxists were said to believe the identity of social actors is derived primarily from their class position. New social movement theorists, by contrast, believe that the heterogeneity of the so-called new movements were concerned more with the processes of symbolic production and the redefinition of social roles than they were of the economy. Culture, meaning, constructed identities, civil society, and newness were the watchwords of choice set against class, the economy, the state, and ostensibly traditional social actors like the working class. Now, if the empirical and theoretical attention to struggles over multiple forms of oppression that this identity approach introduced in novel ways was to be welcomed, and it was to be welcomed in this sense, the theoretical pitfalls of this literature were nonetheless manifold. Only through a deeply ahistorical lens could gender be seen as new and class as old. Only through intense myopia could analysts of social movements forget the crisis tendencies of capitalism, its stagnations and financial panics, or the system's necessarily uneven reproduction of inequalities at national, regional, and international scales, and how these structural conditions influence the dynamics of any struggle under its sun. Only through distortion and caricature of the historical record of the last century or so could the embrace of Marxism 
as an emancipatory theory and practice by multiple oppressed groups themselves, spanning huge swaths of the planet, be willed into invisibility. The identity school, in short, neglected class, neglected capitalism, neglected political economy, and neglected history. The resource mobilization, or strategy school, meanwhile, principally focused in the US Academy of the late 70s into the mid 80s, focused instead on organizations, interests, resources, opportunities, and strategies, and what they saw as focusing on movements as conflicts over goods in a political market. They looked at what they conceived as the instrumental components of collective action, the simultaneity of struggles at the level of civil society and the state, and the continuities they saw between the constitutive actors of the so-called new and the so-called old movements. As Gabriel Hetland and Jeff Goodwin point out in one of the more impressive recent uh, surveys of the absence of capitalism in contemporary social movement studies, there were some in the strategy school, particularly in its early days of the late 70s, early 1980s, who drew on Marxist categories, even if they were not themselves Marxists, and took the constraining and enabling features of capitalism seriously vis-a-vis -vis movement origin, movement development, and movement trajectory. Such attention faded from view, however, as the strategy school shifted its focus over the late 1980s and through the 1990s to what became known as political opportunity structures. The emblematic writings of Sidney Tarot are the key reference points in this term. The major issue with political opportunity structure literature is an excessive focus, in my view, on short-term change in political institutions, regime types, and the like, without sufficient attention to the imbrication of institutions, regime types, and so on, in deep, often longer-term, economic transformations issued forth from the operations of global capitalism. Economics, in other words, is often excised from politics and institutions. Hetland and Goodwin point out, for example, that Charles Tilley and Sidney Tarrell's book, Contentious Politics, perhaps the most influential reference book in social movement studies today, makes no mention whatsoever of capitalism, proletarianization, class conflict, or political economy generally. If identity theorists replaced capitalism and class with culture, meaning, and constructed identities, strategy theorists over time abandoned any early interest in capitalism and class in favor of ostensibly autonomous realms of politics, institutions, and opportunities. What happens to our understanding, then, of popular struggle if we move against these two currents that are still dominant in social movement studies in different ways and we reintroduce capitalism at the heart of our study of social movement and class dynamics. Following Beverly Silver and some of her colleagues, we can introduce a few initial analytical building blocks that take us some way in answering that question. <clears throat> First, at a very basic level, because the commodification of labor is inherent in capitalism, and because human beings grieve and resist their reduction to being commodities, labor struggle is a necessary and perpetual feature of capitalism, leading to variegated forms and scales of political contestation depending on the situation. Second, and still at a very basic level, because the historical development of capitalism introduces recurring organizational transformations of both production and consumption, working classes are perpetually made, unmade, and remade across the globe. Such creative and destructive processes vis-a-vis -vis the working classes help to produce, therefore, different forms of class struggle. The third point at an introductory level is that class struggle, broadly understood, is not reducible to the workplace, and I'll have more to say on this. Rather, unrest associated with labor occurs in the workplace, the labor market, the community, and in national and international politics. Fourth, because capitalism destroys more livelihoods than it creates over time, class conflict associated with a relative surplus population, which is heterogeneous in makeup, but whose membership shares a common condition of partial or total superfluity vis-a-vis -vis capital accumulation, will likely increase in importance as a secular trend. Fifth, capitalism suffers systematically 
from an inescapable tension between profitability on the one hand and legitimacy on the other. Attempts to contain a crisis of legitimacy through improvements in the conditions of the working class can only be sustained for brief intervals and for partial segments of the class as a whole without generating a crisis of profitability. This tension influences and is influenced by movement formation and struggle. Sixth, there is interpenetration between labor movements and status-based movements because of the ways that the historical development of capitalism has involved the mobilization by capitalists, by states, and by workers themselves of status-based distinctions among the working class, gender, race, ethnicity, citizenship, and so on, to foment division or to gain advantage or protection in the marketplace. Pace new social movement theory, struggle around status and struggle around class have been and will continue to be irrevocably interconnected. Seventh and finally, because historical capitalism has been deeply caught up in war making and not just profit making, labor struggle is conditioned by and in turn conditions geopolitics and interstate war. Rather than counterposing culture, meaning, and constructed identities or politics, institutions, and structural opportunities to capitalism and class, the initial analytical building blocks of reintroducing capitalism to social movement studies, which I've just laid out, help us to understand how the real dynamics of the primary subjects, subject areas of identity and strategy theories are themselves infused to the core with capitalist and class content and cannot be properly understood, therefore, without attention to these dynamics. A Marxist approach to social movements has to immediately involve one further issue related to the question of capitalism, and that is the question of capitalist totality. One of the weaknesses of social movement studies in recent decades has been the fragmentation of subject matter. This or that particular social movement is studied in desolate isolation from other movements, opponents, or the wider environment. Along with this has come a ruthless division of labor and territorial policing of borders across the myriad academic disciplines. For example, the hiving off of labor studies into a separate area of inquiry from social movements, or the separation of the study of revolution from the study of social movement. The concept of totality can, can help overcome this fragmentation and enhance our understanding of movements, just as it can inform activists strategy and tactics with regard to connecting existing commonalities and forging new ones across what are on the surface seemingly disparate local and sectional conflicts. Totality allows us to name the capitalist system as an overarching enemy that helps to determine the parameters of, of seemingly fragmented contestations <coughs> over power in capitalist society. It is thus an essential part of the task of Marxism, as Colin Barker and his colleagues has pointed out, to quote, trace and highlight the interconnection between specific issues and particular repertoires of action, organization, and understanding within movements, and the broader social relations of production that explicitly or implicitly they confront. So rather than thinking of social movements in isolation from one another, or reproducing the empty abstraction of a capitalist whole simply determining beforehand the outcome of labor movements in particular settings, we are spurred rather to think through a whole field of emerging political and social struggles with mutual interaction and overlap as a whole with many parts moving at different speeds. In strategic terms, the implications of thinking through totality in relation to social movement leads to Marx's unity of the diverse. In this case, the drawing together of the distinctly oppressed constituent parts of concretely situated working classes into contestational struggle. The multi-layered complexity of capitalist totality and its many determinations is mirrored in the multi-layered complexity of dynamic, situated, historically specific working class subjects. Read through the lens of social movement processes, 
Such complexity, finally, raises the issue of scale. Part of the novelty of the Marxist approach to the study of social movements is to reject the radical separation of locally situated particular struggles and moments, uh, excuse me, on one side, and moments of wide-scale systemic, even rupture, revolutionary rupture on the other side. Instead, seen from a processual vantage point, cognizant of the social totality, oppositional collective action animated in the first instance by specific grievances with initially immediate local targets can sometimes expand, jump scale, towards mutual recognition across difference in wider ranging and more radical projects for change. Projects that come to understand that underlying capitalist dynamics often impinge in complex ways on what at first glance seem to have been localized grievances and injustice. There is therefore no such thing as a revolution which started out from the beginning as a grand systemic rupture uh, on a large scale, but rather starts out in different processes of locally situated particular grievances. And it is therefore a complex process and a continuum of the separation between localized social movement struggles and the possibility of jumping scales into much wider dynamics, even revolutionary change under particular conditions. So this then leads to the tricky issue of class struggle itself. And fundamentally, following Ellen Wood, class can only be conceived either as a location or as a social relation. Static structural pictures, the location approach, may be useful as a starting point for the determining logic of class relations, but there is a long way still to travel in order to identify how a class in itself becomes a class for itself, as Marx understood the movement between an objective class situation and class consciousness, or from social being to, class, to social consciousness. Finding one's way through those dark alleyways requires thinking of class as a social historical process and relationship. One of the richest 20th century practitioners of class analysis in its processual sense was, of course, the historian E.P. Thompson. The working class did not rise like the sun at an appointed time, Thompson famously argues. It was present at its own making. Here he is firmly asserting the importance of human agency in the class struggle, agency that is, however, bounded by the logic of a set of class situations that each person enters into in involuntarily. Understanding class as a relationship in which the common experiences of real people living in real context matter, and which takes place in historical time, means that, to quote Thompson, it evades analysis if we attempt to stop it dead at any given moment and anatomize its structure, unquote. In Thompson's most direct notes on the problem of method in class analysis, he begins by reclaiming class as a historical category. As against varieties of structuralist idealism, and sociological positivism. To quote Thompson again, that is, it is derived from the observation of the social process over time. We know about class because people have repeatedly behaved in class ways, unquote. From such historical observation, general theories of class and class formation emerge that can be used as a starting point for the further exploration of these themes in different societies and in different historical periods. So far, so good for Thompson. The danger, too often manifested in theoretical formulation, however, is the substitution of the new models that have been constructed for the necessary return to further historical investigation of living processes and social relationships. Once a model of class structure exists, to, co to quote Thompson again, it is easy to suppose that class takes place not as a historical process, but inside our heads. Models or structures are theorized that are supposed to give us objective determinants of class, for example, as expressions of, di of differential productive relations, unquote. In rejecting barren schemas of this kind as the last word, Thompson is at the same time careful to stress that he should decisively not be misunderstood to mean that, quote, such static structural analysis is not both valuable and essential. 
but that parameters of such analysis are such that it reveals a determining logic in the sense of both setting limits and exerting pressure and not the historical conclusion or equation that these productive relations equal these class formations, unquote. These are the powerful ordered patterns that the capitalist system produces irrespective of local historical particularities, patterns which are neither steely rails, in Thompson's words, nor mere constellations of circumstance, but rather moving limits whose gradients define what is easy and what is difficult at any moment of time." Unquote. Serious class analysis requires, therefore, scrupulous attention to objective determinations, or class becomes merely a cultural formation. But inquiry into objective determination is no simple input from which class and class consciousness can be derived as the output. Finally, Thompson insists on an inversion of common sociological practices of class analysis. Contra structuralist idealism, class struggle is understood as prior to class and class consciousness, such that we cannot begin with static productive relations and then, by way of what Thompson calls geometric projection, explain class struggle as the result. Such calculations launch us into what Thompson calls a squalid mess a sordid embrace of endless stupidities, of quantitative measurement of classes, or of sophisticated Newtonian Marxism in which classes and class fractions perform their planetary or molecular evolutions." Unquote. It is a fundamental error to assume classes exist independently from history and contestation. And to quote Thompson, that they struggle because they exist, rather than coming into existence out of that struggle. In Thompson's brilliant summation, quote, to put it bluntly, classes do not exist as separate entities, look around, find an enemy class, and then start to struggle. On the contrary, people find themselves in a society structured in determined ways, crucially but not exclusively in productive relations. They experience exploitation or the need to maintain power over those whom they exploit. They identify points of antagonistic interest. They commence to struggle around these issues. And in the process of struggling, they discover themselves as classes. They come to know this discovery as class consciousness. Class and class consciousness are always the last, not the first stage in the real historical process. Of course, despite his great insights, Thompson's writings were crippled by an inattention to distinct layers and complexities of oppression, not least those of gender and race. In an unfortunate and uncharacteristic departure from his well-nigh hysterical commitment to the historicization of the working class in his classic, The Making of the English Working Class, Thompson takes for granted or naturalizes the domestic division of labor, one crucial part of the sphere of social reproduction and in so doing, sidelines women, by and large, from working class historical formation. Likewise, Thompson passes over the role of racialized minorities in the making of the English working class, expelling them, too, from historical memory. <coughs> so long as we are attentive, however, to removing these blinkers that blind us to such historical oppressions and theoretical occlusions, Anderson's second protocol that I mentioned at the outset of this lecture, we would do well to retain in our class struggle approach to social movement study an appropriately, appropriately modified and expanded version of Thompson. In some ways to be more Thompsonian than Thompson was himself by historicizing such things as the sexual division, gender division of labor in the social sphere of reproduction. In this version, the expanded version of Thompson, Thompson's priorities of history, process, temporality, agency, culture, and subjectivity are taken with deadly seriousness, all within the boundaries of a logic of objective determination. Now to shift gears and turn our attention to some of the more potent current debates on manifestations of class struggle in contemporary capitalism and the appropriate emancipatory working class strategy to assume in response. This is the problem of strikes and the problem of riots, and here we'll engage with one of the previous speakers in this series, Joshua Clover. 
the anti-austerity movements that have cropped up in different parts of the world since 2011 have generated a new series of scholarly and activist debates that have sometimes occasioned obfuscating dichotomies between workplace and community, between production and, between circ and circulation. One sees this captured in the very title of Joshua Clover's exemplary recent book, Riot, Strike, Riot. The antipodal repertoires of riot and strike are set against each other in the title itself. The history of contention in the West, from Clover's chronological perspective, moves through the ostensible golden ages of each repertoire of revolt, strike and riot, with appreciation for transitory, blurry borderlines between each epoch. Changes in dominant forms of revolt closely map onto moments of fundamental re reorganization of capitalist production and reproduction. The golden age of riots in early industrializing Western countries, centered on the market or port and contestation in the sphere of circulation, spans the 17th to early 19th centuries, with the strike making slow, overlapping headway onto the scene between 1790 and 1842. From the latter date, 1842, forward to 1973, the strike reigns supreme as the collective action repertoire. Next, from 1973 to the 1980s, a transitional interregnum opens up, characterized by deindustrialization and the concomitant decline in militancy of organized labor in the West. This reorganization of capitalism finds its class struggle expression in the relative and absolute uptick of riots as the emergent repertoire of the present. However, it is more complex than a simple repetition of the earlier era of the riot, which pivoted on the marketplace and directed popular claims against the economy. The new era of the still incipient riot prime involves, according to Clover, surplus populations marginalized from capitalist accumulation at its center. These are disproportionately racialized subjects who are systematic recipients of police violence and who target the state rather than the economy in their resistance. Example, the Los Angeles riots of 1992 on the heels of the filmed beating of Rodney King by police officers and their subsequent acquittal, or the Ferguson riots of 2014 after the police murder of Michael Brown by Officer Darren Wilson and the subsequent decision not to indict Wilson. In sum, the original riot epoch turned on the market and the port, the subsequent strike era on the factory floor, and the present phase of so-called riot prime on the square and on the street. Clover's argument is very bold, but it has a number of weaknesses. It relies on spurious and partial empirical evidence to make sweeping and grand claims. It is characterized both by extreme, unmediated leaps from the abstract to the concrete, as well as an assumed mechanistic synchronicity between the economic and the political. The underlying structure of the argument is a weakly mediated determination between economic change, which is discussed in the book always briefly and almost exclusively, exclusively to, in terms of theoretical abstraction, and changes in repertoires of revolt. For the sociologist Alberto Toscano, who mobilizes Ernest Mandel against Clover in this instance, class struggle ought to be instead treated as a relatively autonomous variable, insofar as what lent downturns and upturns in cycles of accumulation their asymmetry was that class struggle as a partially exogenous factor was crucial in determining the shape of a new round of accumulation. Class struggle itself is marked far more by the outcomes of a previous cycle of contestation than by the present shape of the capital labor relation. Such asynchronous relations between the economic and the political is also at the heart of Kim Moody's recent investigations into capitalist restructuring in the United States, as articulated in his new book with Haymarket on the new terrain of class, con class conflict in this country. Particularly important is Moody's stress on the gap between the economic vulnerability of capital's new logistics uh, clusters to militant labor action and the political weakness of the actually existing organized labor movement in the United States, led predominantly as it is by nationalist and racist business union bureaucrats. The present political weakness has, in other words, inhibited labor 
to realize this potentiality. Therefore, in Moody's work, there is no automaticity between the economic and the political as there is in Clover. Since the mid-1980s, as Moody shows, there have been radical changes to the basic infrastructure of US capitalism. The most recent feature of dramatic reorganization has been the logistics revolution of the last 20 years, characterized by streamlined supply chains connecting producers, retailers, and service providers, such that the flow of goods is digitally tracked and guided on a just-in-time basis, and moved by intermodal transportation systems from node to node, along upgraded rail, road, water, and air corridors, and through high-tech cross-docking warehouses. Time has become the centerpiece of competition in a just-in-time production process. For Moody, therein lies capital's vulnerability. The key nodes of these novel logistical clusters, 60 in the United States, concentrate thousands of mostly blue-collar or manual workers. By one estimate, there are 3.2 million people employed in these clusters, but this leaves out many rail, road, and communications workers and others who service and link the clusters together across the country. <coughs> Just as Clover rings the death knoll of the strike and the birth of the riot prime form, the opportunity to organize hundreds of thousands of workers has announced itself in logistical reconfiguration of American capital. The problem in seizing this opportunity is political, running as politics does, often out of sync with the economic. For Moody, quote, barriers of race, ethnicity, and immigration status, always present, are if anything more pronounced in the aftermath of Trump's victory. Taking on racism and nationalism will be key to organizing and uniting these different groups of workers. In this respect, the legacy of business union ideology and practice presents one barrier to an opportunity that could turn the labor movement around, unquote. All of this is not to advocate a reductionist turn to the point of production in the symptomatic mode of crude workerism. A Marxist approach to the class dynamics of social movements, rather, should insist on encompassing theoretically the lived complexity of variegated struggles across production, reproduction, and social reproduction. Recent trends in Marxist feminism are leading the way forward in this regard and others. So in my final section, I'll deal uh, insofar as I can with the problem of production, reproduction, and social reproduction in relationship to what I've said thus far. Class under capitalism is irreducible to the exploitative relationship of the extraction of surplus value from wage labor by capital that Marx anatomizes at the highest level of abstraction in volume one of Capital. In Cinzia Arutza's apt formulation, quote, to try to explain what capitalist society is only in terms of surplus value extraction is like trying to explain the anatomy of the human body by explaining only how the heart works, unquote. In volume two of Capital, as the late French theorist Daniel Ben Said emphasizes, the introduction of circulation and productive and unproductive labor into the analysis broaches a radically more complex set of social relations than the immediate relation of production interrogated in volume one. Here in the second volume, through the sphere of circulation, we come to understand that the relation of buying and selling labor power is no less constitutive of the class relation than the relation of exploitation disclosed in volume one. Finally, in volume three, reproduction as a whole is introduced as further specificity of, deter of the determination of the class relation. The partial determination of classes outlined in volumes one and two at the level of the extraction of surplus value in the production processes and the sale of labor power in the circulation process are in volume three integrated into the overall dynamic of competition, equalization of the profit rate, the functional specialization of capitals, and the distribution of revenue. The implication is that classes are determined in the fullest sense by the combination of the relation of exploitation and production, the wage relation, and the productivity, non-productivity of labor and circulation, and the distribution of revenue as a whole. So far, though, we have only specified with any depth production and reproduction, and not the more specific domain of social reproduction. 
a long-standing concern of some of the best work in Marxist feminist analysis, and in particular, a new season of study of social reproduction by Tithi Bhattacharya, Chintia Arutza, Sue Ferguson, Kate Doyle Griffiths, David McNally, Alan Sears, among many others. Social reproductive labor in this literature is the work involved in maintaining and reproducing human life. Under capitalism, most of this labor has been performed unpaid by women within the family union, unit. But portions have also been carried out to different degrees and in different social formations and in different historical periods by the welfare state or through the market with variations traceable in part to the strength or weakness of feminist struggle in distinct strength, settings and circumstances. The circuit of social reproduction is not limited to childbirth, childcare, and kin-based maintenance and reproduction of wider human life within the family unit, but also extends outward further to include education, healthcare, leisure institutions, and the care of the elderly. Incorporating social reproduction seriously involves a widening of our conception of class relations, class struggle, and the working class subject beyond the workplace. Such a totalizing conception allows for the elucidation of, in the words of Tithi Bhattacharya, the, quote, myriad capillaries of social relations extending between the workplace, home, schools, hospitals, a wider social whole sustained and co-produced by human labor in contradictory yet constitutive ways. One finds actu across actually existing societies in the contemporary world that these social relations are constituted, again in the words of Bhattacharya, the chaotic, multi-ethnic, multi-gendered, differently abled subject that is the global working class. Recall that the logic of capitalist accumulation acts as an objective determination across the united spheres of production, reproduction, and social reproduction in terms of the imposition of constraints or the setting of limits to behavior. With regard to social reproduction, this suggests that the different forms assumed by the labor of social reproduction in different societies and across distinct time periods, the balance of the market, state, and family in its execution, remains a contingent question that depends on specific historical dynamics and feminist struggles. The fact that struggle partially determines the form of labor of social reproduction in capitalist societies has crucial implications for an expanded Marxist sense of class struggle and the class dynamics of multiple movements. This is because it is also true that, to quote Bhattacharya again, the way social reproduction functions within a given social formation has an intrinsic relation to the way that production and reproduction of societies are organized in their totality, and therefore to class relations, unquote. There is an organizing logic to the intersections of these battles, in other words, and not merely a series of contingent collisions. As Kate Doyle Griffiths has pointed out in her on-the-ground analytical reportage, the growing wave of teacher strikes in this country at the moment, so far West Virginia, Oklahoma, Kentucky, and possibly Arizona, are simultaneously women-led class struggles in the workplace, and given the character of that workplace, the school, class struggles over social reproduction. In conclusion, let me sum up the series of the basic claims I've made. First, the terrain of international class struggles was transformed in the 1980s and 1990s by the rollout of neoliberal restructuring with huge setbacks for the global working class, but with some exceptional insurgencies in new geographical areas that were attracting manufacturing investment on a new scale, especially in China. Latin America became the scene of explosive extra-parliamentary resistance to a regional crisis of neoliberalism in the late 1990s and early 2000s, before the gravitational pull of collective action shifted to southern Europe and the Arab world in the world historic year of 2011. The United States, too, from a very, very low starting point, witnessed some revival of struggle through Occupy, Wisconsin, Black Lives Matter, immigrant rights, the Bernie Sanders campaign, and the growth of the DSA. In the current moment, we are witnessing the simultaneity of workplace and social reproductive battles in the wave of teacher strikes gripping this country. 
Second, mainstream social movement studies has been ill-equipped to respond theoretically to new developments in class struggle and socio-political attention, mainly because it has lost an interest in capitalism altogether over the last several decades. Third, attention to capitalist totality can help to transcend a tendency in social movement studies toward a fragmentation of subject matter and the abandonment of totalizing theory. Politically, it is also important in terms of strategic orientation insofar as it can assist in making visible commonalities between distinct movements and the possibilities of forging new commonalities where none presently exist. Fourth, a multidimensional, historical, and processual approach to class allows for the insertion into social movement studies the most important theoretical component of Marxism in this domain. That is the stress on class dynamics in every movement, as distinct from sometimes thinking in class terms and otherwise not so much or not at all. The theory of class struggle advanced has offered a way of tackling the complexly organized, mediated, and articulated social relations of oppression and exploitation under capitalism and the distinct forms of resistance they engender. Fifth and finally, debates around class struggle in the West in the current period of capitalism have returned to the question of repertoire in particular to strike or to riot. It is premature and certainly beyond available evidence to proclaim a new era of riot prime. It is also important to understand the new potentialities of capitalist vulnerability introduced through dramatic reconfigurations of logistics clusters in the United States and elsewhere. The problem for labor in seizing these opportunities is a political one. And that political problem arises because of the frequently asynchronous relationship between the economic and the political. This potentiality should not be read as a green light for a return to crude work workerism at the point of production. Rather, we require a sensitivity to struggle across the domains of production, reproduction, and social reproduction. And the present moment also throws up the issue of how new upsurges of labor militancy so often occur where they are least expected. While in hindsight, the Chicago teacher strike of 2012, albeit with distinct politics of race and a distinct geography of occurring in a major urban setting, presaged the current strike wave in the teaching sector in this country, few predicted beforehand West Virginia, Kentucky, Oklahoma, or Arizona would become the epicenters of a hopeful new moment in the history of labor militancy in the United States. But here we are. And our theory has to catch up in order to contribute to the latest shifts in terrain of class struggle in practice. Thanks very much. So I think uh, I'm chairing, I'll chair the Q&A, all right. Let's grab the, the water. So like yesterday, uh, so I don't take too long responding to each question. I'll take a series of questions if, there's a, if there are more than one, and then we can do multiple rounds of those. So thanks for your talk. Uh, I was hoping you could share your perspectives on the relationship between the environment and class struggle, given how capitalism is not only predicated on the extraction of surplus value from labor, but also on the extraction of natural resources and pollution, especially considering climate change? Yeah, a very general question. Until the um, 1990s, the idea that there was an alternative to capitalism was, was manifested in the reality of alternatives, however, however critical one might be of them. The, um, one of the problems with thinking about class struggle in the world today is the elusiveness of the notion of an alternative to capitalism to the participants in many of these struggles, even when they have very advanced critiques of capitalism. So there was a time when if you had an advanced critique of capitalism, you also had, it came along with it, an understanding of the broad shape of an alternative. Um, and that's really not true now, I think. Uh, which, um, and that's a fairly fundamental issue within the Marxian way of thinking about 
struggle within systems and struggle over systems. And if, uh, if you just reflect on that problem and how that lends a distinctive character to the current period. Okay. I'm not sure how to ask this, but I'm, um, I'm wondering about the shift from riots to strikes to riots. Um, because I think there's a difference in the riots today from the labor struggles that we've seen in the past, and even in the strikes that we're seeing in the teachers' movement, just that they're focused on the state rather than on employers. I wonder if you think that makes any difference to the character of struggle. So maybe I'll start with those and then uh, see if there are more. Okay, so um, on the environment and, and class struggle. Um, the best way to talk about this, I think, is uh, on, on two different levels, a theoretical level and a, and a, um, a practical, concrete, historically situated level. Uh, on the theoretical level, I absolutely agree, although there are major debates on how to do this, of course, but to understanding <clears throat> nature, and not humans as separate from nature, but as a part of nature, but non-human nature as the necessary substratum to all of capitalist activities. So that um, it is absolutely essential, not just reasons, uh, not just for reasons of ecological sustainability uh, and avoidan avoidance of collapse, um, but also theoretically in understanding the dynamics of capital to properly reintegrate um, reintegrate this. And there's a, I think, an overly polarized debate at the moment between people like Jason Moore, who tried to understand, therefore, that there is no proper distinction between nature and society, but that they're collapsed into one another now, and we need to think of nature as an agent on its, as an agent of itself in the shaping of capitalism. So that coal, for example, is an actor in the dynamics of capitalism when coal is important, oil becomes an actor, etc. And then Andreas Malm's recent uh, polemic in, against Moore, in which saying, if we are to do anything about the distinction, or sorry, to, to resolve ecological problems today, we need to maintain the analytical distinction between uh, nature and society, and then within society to understand the specific roles of capital in shaping the ecological crisis as against the Anthropocene, which condemns all of humanity to this problem. The problem is actually capital, traceable to a particular phase of industrial capitalism. But it's not nature as an agent, because if nature is an agent, uh, this notion of agency becomes uh, completely, um, be completely nebulous. That is to say, you do, you do not have to have any foresight in order to be an agent. Coal becomes an agent and so on. So there's this trend of, of thinking, about, um, thinking about the relationship between ecology and capitalism at a level of extraction, I think, is very, very interesting uh, debates. And going back to, to Neil Smith, uh, O'Connor, uh, John Bellafine Foster, and so on. Then there's the situated context in which I know the best, which is the intensification of, of extractive capitalism in Latin America at the moment. Um, and where I think you see some of the most impressive forms of class struggle, although not reducible to class, class is a part of it, is against the intensification of mining mineral extraction, natural gas and oil extraction, and agro-industrial monocropping in Latin America today. So that, for example, uh, Canadian mining corporations, which are, Canada has the biggest uh, mining industry in the world and the biggest presence in Latin America of any, uh, of any mining capital, there are 150 open conflicts with Canadian mining corporations at any given moment in Latin America. All of these, I think, are understandable only in a conception of capitalism, and only in a conception of these uh, extra workplace struggles against the expansion of capital, mining capital in this instance, ecologically destructive mining capital, as class struggle. But not as class struggle that emerges in a workplace, but class struggle, for example, as indigenous territorial rights claims over uh, self-governance of, of a certain territory, um, uh, uh, making claims against uh, their right to um, to the extent that they can have subsistence economies outside of the market, which is obviously not entirely outside of the market, but to the extent that they can maintain communal practices 
runs up against the logic of capital and also expresses the front line of ecological struggle. And I think this belies the, uh, frankly, idiotic characterization of eco ecology struggles as, sometime, as somehow uh, pitted against labor struggles. Ecological struggles, in any serious sense, are struggles of labor. So, I mean, there's more that we could say about that, but th that would be my initial, that would be my initial attempt. Uh, so until the 1990s, there was, a, there was an idea of an alternative of capitalism. Um, um, and, uh, you know, as the, as the kind of, the, the pithy comment of, of Frederick Jameson that's, that's always thrown around about the, it's easier to imagine the end of the world, which connects to ecology, uh, than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And no doubt, in the place that I know best, uh, Latin America, in the 1960s, 1970s, um, even in the broad left, not just the far left, the, uh, the extent to which it was common sense to believe that a socialist revolution was necessary and probable in your lifetime was very, very widespread. And by the early 1990s, uh, was, was diminishing to almost statistically nothing. Um, uh, but, but also using Latin America, I think, debates around socialism reemerge. Not, not with having a solution to what's coming next, but to reopen the question, i.e. not this kind of fatalism that there is no alternative um, over the contradictory processes of this new left. And right now, in this very particular conjuncture, we're back to a very pessimistic fallout of the collapse of that, of that uh, particular project. But um, I think linking to the question of ecology, although it's unclear to people um, what the alternative will be, I think, in fact, the idea that there has to be an alternative is increasingly uh, widespread, even in, even in a context of, of a country like the United States, to the extent that if you look at generational polling, for example, I mean, these are, these are anecdotal tidbits, but I think they add up to something. The, this, the, the idea that, for example, I, I was involved and in, I'm still involved in the UCU strike over pensions in the UK, there was that, um, I forget which magazine it appeared in, but the poll around um, uh, more, more, mille more millennials have a, have, a, have a sense of a pension plan uh, involving an end to capitalism, that is the establishment of socialism, seems more realistic than having a pension plan when they retire inside of capitalism. But they, of course, what they mean by socialism is in, in the American context is what in Europe, Europeans would call social democracy. Uh, they, they really don't need an end to capitalism. Uh, Obama was called a socialist after all in the United States by the right. And those opinion polls are tapping into that discursive space. Sure, sure. I wasn't, everything doesn't rest on that. But the, but the point is that even that sensibility of socialism, i.e. not being a dirty word associated with, with uh, bureaucratic authoritarian uh, Soviet rule is itself an opening into something that wasn't there, even if I uh, totally understand that the DSA is a social democratic movement. It's not a revolutionary organization. Um, but I think, uh, at a minimum, what you saw a little glimmer of, even in, in the, uh, the short-lived uh, anti-globalization movement, so-called, of the late 90s and early, early 2000s, was an overcoming, which is a basic first step, an overcoming of the sense that your locally situated struggle is actually determined by locally situated problems. It is in fact connected to something much bigger. And I think that connection was quite widespread. For the first time, the World Bank and the IMF become objects of widespread hatred and as organizing of something, and for, some, for a smaller layer of the movement, as the organizers of dynamics of, of capitalism and associations with, and this was all shut down through the close down of the, the war on terror and, and, and all of this, but reopening, reopening up. Um, so I think uh, at the moment, I think we need to have a sense of, um, of what Tara Eagleton said, and I don't know, he writes a book every year, but uh, two books ago, um, 
the idea of hope without optimism, uh, or optimism without hope. I should get that. Correct. Hope without optimism, because optimism is a prediction. Of right, right. Hope without optimism. Right. That's it. Um, in the sense of coming to grips with the scale of the defeat, the scale of the absence of not only. I mean, for me, it's less important actually, the vision of the, the absence or presence of the vision of the future, than the scale of what the absence of what Alan Sears talks about. Uh, as the, de the decomposition of an infrastructure of, of dissent. The extent to which, not just in the workplace, but in all modes of what uh, was a terrain of class struggle in informal, uh, informal uh, community organizations, trade union halls, uh, um, radical um, uh, ethnic affiliations with labor, uh, with their union halls, radical pubs, radical bookstores, radical infrastructures of, of, of life, along with parties and so on, this entire infrastructure of dissent has been entirely obliterated over the last 40 years. And so this is where you don't, there's no grounds for optimism in the sense of even, even these struggles uh, that are emerging are still very defensive. Even this teacher's wave of struggles is against, uh, you know, her, the horrific, conditions that we've been learning about, about Oklahoma teachers, right? Um, but, um, I mean, it's an enormous question about how this relates to, to but for me, it's, it's, it is through that process of struggle that the possibility of, of starting to imagine a future will come out of, rather than uh, independently coming upon an idea of a future that is then that is then um, distributed to, 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 to the struggles. So the idea coming out of this uh, is that. And also, also Daniel Ben Said's notion, writing, I think, his best book, um, uh, Marks for Our Times in English, um, at the point of total pessimism in the mid-1990s, in which he says, Struggle doesn't require a belief in the in a revolutionary transformation in your lifetime. All it requires is that you want to avoid the indignity of not having fought. That's all it requires. Uh, and for him, he said in the mid 1990s, as a revolutionary Marxist, he had no uh, he had no anticipatory. Uh, teleological sense that he was going to be victorious, not just in his lifetime, but perhaps ever. But the horrendousness of the current period, on its own, was enough to seek a revolutionary transformation. That's probably an inadequate attempt, but that, that's, that's... There you go. All right, then the, the question of, um, uh, of riots and strikes uh, and the turn to new riots, okay? So, I mean, uh, Clover's book is, is very frustrating in the sense that there are these glimmers of insight attached to enormous claims, uh, which I think are sometimes uh, potentially indicating some kind of tendency that might be real, um, but, make, but projecting claims far beyond what he has evidence to suggest. So for example, he says at some points in the book that he's talking about just the West. But then he brings in Egypt as a confirmation of his, his theory. Then he brings in Chinese workers' riots as, com as, a, com as a confirmation of the riot form. Then he talks about the question that you've just asked about riots focusing on the state. Um, and I think we can't make that general claim. I, I, I mean, I think that's sometimes true, uh, but sometimes not. And it's also very difficult to know what, where the state ends and where the economy begins in this sense. So, for example, I certainly don't think, if you look at the Arab world in the last, even before the tragic turnaround of those events, at the beginning of that period, um, the, the slogan was bread. That is, that is... Yeah, but it was about the state subsidies. Sure, sure. But, my point there is being that there's no, there is no state outside of the economy in this, in this, in this sense. That there, there isn't something called the economy which exists outside of 
state regulation, determination, influence, and so on. Nor is there a state that is not influenced in turn by the capitalist dynamics of the economy. Um, but in the particular uh, slogan of a of a of a strike for bread, is it is it, it is an attempt to set prices. It's an attempt through collective bargaining of the riot, as Thompson would talk about, of setting prices. It's a classical food riot, which were already occurring in the early 1990s. I think that's quite different than a riot against uh, police violence, riots around racialized forms of of constant state regulation, although that too is a product of dynamics of the creation of um, uh, hyper, hyper racialized unemployment or relative surplus population in this country which needs to be policed by the state in different ways. Um, so, I mean, I think riots need to be understood um, or at least require that we move from levels of high abstraction such that, such that riots just target the state towards then several mediations down to concrete situations when you look at actually existing riots. That would be my, my answer with those two examples. Um, but if, I, if, I, if, if that's unsatisfactory, I can, I can try it again. Are there, are there any follow-ups or other questions at the back? Um, you talked a little bit about historicity and... Speak, speak up a little. You talked about uh, his, historicizing um, a lot of the movements and as well as uh, you uh, linking production to production to social reproduction and, and how certain events can... Um, turn into revolutionary ideals, and I just wanted to ask for some examples where there were uh, all three things um, of production and social production, as well as um, uh, class-based struggles kind of linking together in a movement that has revolutionary potential. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to ask this, but it's highly related to Eric and Faith's question. So, so there are many, um, across the world, many uh, movements, riots, but um, it seems like people have different demands. And uh, what, uh, what are those movements are achieving or trying to achieve? Is trying to transform states? or tr transformation of relations production, or simply just for uh, substance, survival. Yeah. In, uh, so what's the goal? What, what's, the, yeah, what's the alternative for this? <laughs> yeah. OK. Anything else? We'll try those. Uh, historical specificity. An example of movements linking up these different struggles across production, reproduction, and social reproduction. Uh, I mean, a good example uh, for me uh, is uh, the country I know best in terms of this dynamic is, is, is Bolivia. And you can see this between 2000 and 2005 in what I consider to be the closest thing to a properly revolutionary situation. Uh, arguably in the 21st century, although we can talk about different particularity of different cases in the, in the Middle East. Um, but how did that cycle of uh, a quasi-insurrectionary cycle happen in Bolivia? What did it start off with? It started off with a municipal struggle over water rights. Privatization of water in a municipal uh, city, um, a contestation over that. So this is both an ecological struggle, this is a struggle about a key over the commodification or decommodification of arguably these, the principal source of the reproduction of life, your access to water. That was the center dynamic of the, of the first point of, that, of what became 
a revolutionary cycle. But in no sense was that particular moment, could you somehow trace back to that moment the idea that this would become a revolutionary cycle? No one knew that this would happen. They were struggling over a particular issue of, of water. So it's a reproductive struggle in this sense, and a social reproductive struggle in this sense because it meant, uh, with tariff increases, it meant uh, your ability to reproduce yourself inside of family households and working class communities in the, in the, in the, in the area. But who was leading uh, what became the coordinadora, the coordinator of this movement? The principal actor was the Federation of Factory Workers, principally shoe workers. Uh, which, is, which is not supposed to happen in theories of labor aristocracy and so on. These are the highest paid workers in, the, in Cochabamba, the longest, most militant union in the Sioux Factory Worker, which was led by the, pr the president of that union was uh, Oscar Oliveira. Oscar Oliveira, however, seeing the changes in, in class composition at the time and the informalization of the world of work, said that factory workers need to use their particular uh, vantage point at the point of production to relate outside to the entire class. So what did they do? They set up, long before this water struggle, they set up in the middle of the central plaza uh, what they called the May Day School, which was their offices in which everyone was open to come in, any section of the working class, any member, didn't have to be a member of their union, to come in both for a series of lectures every week, but also for any grievances that they had. It became the principal organizing hub. It was out of the coordinadoras, it then became the Federation of Factory Workers headquarters. The May Day School became the quarters, headquarters for the struggle over water. Um, and through that struggle then, you had workplace struggles that, um, around the restructuring of the world of work between formal and informal sector workers, reproductive struggles over the question of water, and so on, etc. That struggle on a local scale, um, was the first successful struggle of beating back neoliberal restructuring in the country in 15 years. That is, they achieved the reversal of privatization of water, the establishment of the reestablishment of, of a municipal uh, water source with no tariffs for working class communities. Because of this example, different struggles start to happen elsewhere. Water and land privatization struggles in the western part of the country, first in the rural area, where they were trying trying out new extensions of uh, capital-intensive agro-industrial restructuring and moving into uh, attempts to uh, reverse communal land structures of indigenous territories in the West. That linked up to a much bigger question, which was the question of natural gas, the principal uh, commodity, the principal source of foreign exchange of the entire country. So from the water wars, eventually after a series of struggles, both rural and urban, over commodification, over reproductive access to things like land and water, towards contestation of a much bigger uh, uh, commodity for the reproduction of capitalism in the country, natural gas, and eventually demands to socialize and nationalize the natural gas industry for redistribution uh, domestically. In 2003 and 2005, this struggle became so big uh, that they were capable of shutting down the country for weeks at a time, occupying the capital with enormous numbers of people, and overthrowing two presidents in succession, before this was channeled back into an electoral constitutional exit and the election of Abel Morales, as the elections were moved up. But if you look at that period, 2003 to 2005, there were significant layers of the movement who did not want to see this channeled into elections, who wanted to see the establishment of what they called an organic constituent assembly, represented immediately by the principal trade union federations, peasant federations, indigenous federations, and so on, in the restructuring of the entire state and society. These were, in my view, revolutionary aims, which lost. I mean, it wasn't a revolution in any sense, ultimately. Uh, but you can't read back into this simplistically, in this sense. So I think there you have all the elements that I'm talking about. Uh, labor struggles at the point of production, strikes were a fundamental part of this, land and water struggles and struggles over natural gas itself. Uh, in terms of the movements and riots around the, around the world, what are they demanding? Are they demanding transformations in state? Are they demanding um, a whole series of transformative aims or are these survival-based goals? So what are the goals? I think, um, 
it's a good question. My tendency when we look at these things is to not see uh, or to emphasize that goals and demands are not static dynamics in these movements. What, what is a goal on the first day can be quite um, peripheral to what it becomes. So in a very basic example, which is not a riot, nor the most militant strike in the world, but one that I'm involved in right now, the struggle over uh, pensions in the UK. I'm a lecturer in the UK. They're trying to uh, make our pension uh, effectively unlivable so that we'd be receiving about 10,000 K a year. Most of us don't own property. This means we can't live after we, so we, we will never retire. Um, that struggle started out, obviously, about pensions. The demand was not even an offensive demand, but offense, just keep our pensions the same. As shitty as they are, keep them where they are. Surprisingly, I was very pessimistic at, at the beginning of the strike four weeks ago, and there were very good reasons to be pessimistic. Our union leadership had sold us out two times in the past, in the last two strikes, only three years and six years ago. But this turned out to be the most militant strike in higher education in recent memory in the United Kingdom. And what began as a pension struggle is now a, pe now a struggle, very commonly on all the picket lines in all of the organizations, over the marketization of the university. People are demanding an end to, uh, for example, the research excellence framework, performance management, the, the, the end to student tuitions. The marketization of pensions is attached to tuition fees rocketing in order to have students come on board. One of the principal demands at, at my particular university became uh, the combination of saving our pensions, reintroducing student bursaries for the poorest uh, students of our, of our neighborhood. Uh, an occupation of students that happened because of the strike was specifically around the bursaries and the marketization of that structure. So at the beginning of the strike, the point is, the demands seem very basic and, and quite singular, a demand about pensions. Um, but the way, the way this strike evolved, you have a whole series of new demands. Obviously, we're not talking about a revolutionary situation. We're talking about a movement from pensions to a movement of modest attempt to stop processes of marketization in a very hostile environment. Similarly, um, on a much broader scale, though, obviously, the, the processes of the, of the Arab world, uh, in Egypt, for example, you have four years of... Uh, uh, um, What's his name? Uh, Joel. Joel. At Stanford, do people know the historian of? Uh, Joel Bennett. Joel Bennett um, has written one of the better books on this topic. What what appears to come out of nowhere in Egypt in 2011 is really a process of highly militant workplace sector struggles of uh, of, of of militant independent trade unionists attempting to establish militant independent trade union in Egypt under very hostile conditions with very mediocre demands, defensive demands against 40 years of neoliberal restructuring. Although these are immediate sectional demands and you couldn't predict that this was going to build into something else, you also can't understand the 2011 eruption in Egypt without understanding the dynamics of the, of the series of increasingly militant strikes that precede them. In Tunisia, the principal uh, uh, source of the initial explosions was again, I mean, there was the catalyst of the, of, the, of the street vendor setting himself on fire, but how this was politicized was through the Trade Union Federation. Uh, and again, then it grows to, to quasi-revolutionary demands of the anti-dictatorship, uh, uh, and so on. Although usually not uh, a sense of socialist revolution, at least a political revolution in the sense of getting rid of dictatorships, which were attached to um, struggles against capitalism. In Egypt, again, for example, you cannot separate out the struggle against the authoritarianism of the Egyptian state without understanding that the military which is built into the state is also a section of the capitalist class. The military is one of the biggest owners uh, of private accumulation in Egypt. They own most of the tourist resorts. They, mo they own large swaths of, of, of uh, different sectors of the economy. So the struggle against the state and the authoritarian structure was also necessarily became a struggle of potentially transformative. Now, of course, this failed, right? 
But the, my point is, is just this, that the demands at the beginning of struggle are no indication of what demands will be later on. Um, and that there is this possibility of jumping scales, which is only a possibility. Um, but that is one of the things that one learns if they even going through a basic dynamic of a, of a strike. The, the balance of forces at the beginning does not presage the outcome. Anything else? I guess we're over. Yeah, we're done. Okay, thank you.